Now, during this next section of the videotape, you will hear from people who have been involved in events where objects of extraterrestrial origin have landed or have crashed or been forced down and which have been retrieved. This is, of course, explosive testimony. It establishes the reality of the phenomenon and also of the fact that we have been studying this phenomenon for years. Many people will think that this is limited to the so-called Roswell event of the 1940s. This could not be further from the truth. In fact, there have been multiple events, at least a couple of dozen events, where objects of extraterrestrial origin have been acquired, have been retrieved, and which have been studied. We think that this is something which is ex of extreme importance because you cannot consider that covert programs, having spent hundreds of billions of dollars over the decades on research and development, so-called reverse engineering or back engineering of extraterrestrial technologies, have not had significant breakthroughs. The testimony will show that, in fact, we have, that we have had breakthroughs which have trickled out to our society in the form of certain advances in electronics. However, the central breakthrough dealing with the physics of the quantum vacuum space, the so-called zero-point energy phenomenon, as well as the anti-gravity electrogravitic phenomenon, that these technologies have been withheld from our society. Back in 1962, I was lieutenant at Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany. <coughs> Excuse me. I was a crypto officer for the entire uh, Ramstein Air Base. I was a top secret control officer. And in that capacity, I happened to see a classified message go through my comm center which said that a UFO has crashed on the island of Spitsbergen, Norway, and a team of scientists are coming to investigate it. I do not recall where the message came from, where it was going to, because in that capacity, we were oftentimes told, what you see here, leave here. But I can recall seeing that. We were in the basement of the Pentagon, and in those days, that was in 1959, uh, there was a tremendous amount of security there in the basement of the Pentagon. Anybody who's worked there knows what I'm talking about. I uh, learned a lot about Project Blue Book. Uh, Blue Book was discussed quite openly in the office. Uh, sections of Blue Book were open for discussion. And uh, then there were other matters as well that, that were brought to uh, our attention one afternoon when, when we uh, were just about ready to finish up training. It was about 3.30, maybe quarter of four in the afternoon. Uh, Colonel Hollibird brought out a piece of, of what appeared to be uh, a metallic, uh, it was a metallic piece of, looked like about a, it looked like a yardstick. Um, it, uh, it had uh, deciphering, it had, it had encryption on it. He did it, describe them as being symbols of, of, uh, of instruction. And that's as far as he would go, but, but he, did in, he did infer that, that, that the instructions, whatever they might have been, uh, were something that, uh, that uh, was important enough for the military to, uh, to keep working on on a, on a constant basis. Uh, it seemed giant-like when I saw it because it was the first time I'd ever seen anything like this before, and, and all eyes uh, were, were just peeled on that particular thing and when he told us what it was it uh, uh, it was frightening it was eerie there you could have heard a pin drop in the room when, when it was first mentioned well he said it would, had been taken from one of the craft that had uh, crashed in uh, in New Mexico and that it had been taken from a box of materials that the military was working on and uh, they didn't use the word uh, reverse engineering at that time, but the, it was some, something similar to the reverse engineering uh, that they felt like uh, uh, they, uh, they needed to work on and it was going to take years to do this. Extraterrestrial bodies, yes. Um, there were either three or five and, and, and they didn't even know at that point uh, because some of the uh, 
Some of the information that they had gotten apparently was, was incomplete, but three or five stands out in my mind as, as the number that, uh, that were taken. Uh, they were, one was alive, uh, partially alive at the time that uh, this happened, and I do not know what may have happened to him after that. The, uh, the findings that were put in there were highly scientific, uh, and they were highly gone over uh, by, by uh, the people that, uh, that knew, what, knew what they wanted to put in there. Um, now this information was information that would never get out to, uh, <clears throat> to anyone else, but it was designed for the use of, of particular military personnel. There were probably 1,500 reported cases at that time. I would say there probably were between two and 300 cases of lock-on. And that's why those cases were in there, uh, because they were authentic. Uh, you saw an awful lot. You saw a lot of the pictures. Um, most of the pictures we have seen duplicates of today. Uh, some were, the pictures that I saw were I think uh, maybe uh, a little bit better. Uh, they were taken by uh, Air Force pilots, as were well pictures of, of the stuff. UFOs. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they actually had pictures of UFOs in these. Oh, places. indeed they did. Yes, not only the Air Force, but but uh, some were taken by civilian pilots. Uh, some were taken by uh, uh, Marine Air Corps uh, pilots. Uh, and, and some were foreign. The whole process of dealing with, with, uh, with the UFO f uh, phenomenon uh, could not be handled anymore by one agency. And so in order to keep it alive, and I guess as cheaply as possible, it was, it was given to various and sundry parts of the government to work on. And I guess they thought that they could, they could also keep the intelligence uh, factor as, uh, as secret as possible by, by giving little ag agencies a little bit here and a little bit there, and that oftentimes is done with, with matters like this. But, but what happened was Eisenhower got sold out. I think that he realized that all of a sudden this, this, this matter is, is going into, uh, into the control of corporations. He uh, realized that he was losing control he realized that this, this the phenomenon of, of, uh, of whatever it was that, uh, that we were faced with uh, was not going to be in the best hands. And that, that, those were the, as far as I can remember, that was the expression that was used. It's not going to be in the best hands. And so it has turned out to be. One day, uh, Sergeant uh, Allen and uh, and uh, uh, the other the other sergeant and I, I'll remember his name soon. Sergeant Atkins. They were and Sergeant uh, Montalegra and, and uh, they they came to us and said, "Look, you know, we got we got a situation where we we have one an aircraft crash that's possibly friendly, and they need us to go and, and secure the crash site." And uh, well, we found the area really easy because there was a there was a huge gash in the land where where something had crashed. Everything was burned, and it was like like if you had almost cut like a, a warm butter with a knife. I mean, it was just it's like it's it's like something on fire or had enter or some kind of energy like a laser almost had had like gutted. I mean, it was really strange, and and basically we were the first ones to see the object. And basically what happened is we didn't go straight up the hill because basically this thing went up the hill and then off into the side of, 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 of the ravine or the ridge. This is about a 200-foot ridge at least. It was buried in, a, in, in the side of the cliff. But anyway, we didn't go straight up. We went to the, to the, to on to the left and walked up to the top of the ridge. And that's when we saw the crash.